Welcome into the Cougar Tailgate, where BYU fandom lives. Here's your host, Cole Wissinger. Good, glorious morning, Cougar fans. Or, I guess afternoon. I just hope you had a good night's sleep last night, because it is a busy, busy day for BYU sports. Good luck. Go out to the tennis and swimming and diving teams, as they have a couple invitationals they're up to today. Women's volleyball is into conference play, and they've got the Dons of San Francisco. Women's and men's basketball are both in action. The ladies have their first game of the season in Washington State. Cougars versus Cougars tipping off at 2 p.m. Utah time. Also at 2, the fellas renew an old rivalry on the court against San Diego State here at the Marriott Center. Later on tonight, also in Provo, women's soccer completes their regular season against LMU. I say regular season because this undefeated Cougar team on campus is definitely looking forward to the tournament. And of course, also in Provo tonight, it is football, BYU and Liberty University. Later in the show today, I will talk with the play-by-play guy for Liberty to help us get to know this new opponent to Lavelle Edwards Stadium. We'll chat independent, not technically a conference, standings, and we'll hear from the Rock president and vice president about what the student section has planned for all these games on campus today. And we can just keep all this excitement rolling on, because the Cougars had a pretty good day First last weekend, too. At the Utah State 16-yard line. Hall, shotgun, Lopini right hip. Tight trips left in a triangle. Option look, keeper, Jaron, 10, 5, touchdown, Cougars! Jaron Hall scores, and the Cougars retake the lead! That Jaron Hall touchdown early in the second quarter would put BYU up for good on the way to a comfortable win over the Aggies. The victory snapped a two-game losing streak against Utah State in the rivalry that we talked just so much about last week and improved the Cougars' record to 4-4 four and four on the season. The Cougar offense got off to a quick start in the first quarter with a 93-yard touchdown drive that was capped off by a 6-yard Levahifo touchdown run. After Utah State fumbled on their next drive, the Cougars took it and marched down the field all the way to the 6-yard line, but a fumble of their own left them empty-handed. QB Jordan Love got the Aggies on the board on the ensuing drive to tie the game at 7. Early in the second quarter, Kavika Fenua picked off Love, won't be the last time I say that today, and gave the Cougars great field position. The offense only needed one play, a little Jaron Hall TD scamper that we heard earlier, to get into the end zone. Another Cougar interception later in the second quarter, this time by Peyton Wilgar, would once again be turned into points for the Cougars. Hall led the offense down the field and was able to finish it off on his own again with a second touchdown run that put him up 14 points with just over two minutes left in the first half. Utah State wasn't ready to give up the old wagon wheel just yet, though. They pieced together a long touchdown drive to make it a one-possession game going into the half, with the Cougs leading 21-14. to will he take a snap there? He will, under center, wide receiver, bubble screen inside for a touchdown! It's the brother act, Baylor to Gunner for the score! You wouldn't know by those cheers that the game was in Logan, huh? That was the first brother-to-brother touchdown in BYU history. Congrats, Romney family. After Jaron Hall was ruled out with concussion-like symptoms following that other touchdown run late in the first half, Baylor Romney took over the reins of the offense and didn't miss a beat. He connected with Micah Simon for a touchdown to start the second half. Defense did their job with a three and out, then tossed it to his brother Gunner to push the score to 35-14. to A 77-yard Lopini Katoa catch and run set well himself up for a short touchdown dive. Score 42-14 and that's your final. The Cougar defense did not allow any points in the second half and forced five turnovers on the day. BYU's defense is now tied for fifth in the nation in total interceptions and the team is tied for 10th in the nation in turnover margin. Jaron Hall had 268 total yards running and passing in the first half, and then Baylor Romney had over 200 when he took over in the second. Oh, and by the way, Zach Wilson, the starting quarterback, is coming back soon. 
I just like the fact that these guys have so much faith in each other and they're working really well together. The culture of the team has been all about loving each other and learning as much as we can to get better. And uh, the one thing I can say is we're getting better every week. And, and, and the fact that we're able to do it after wins, even tonight before I got on the headphones, the players were talking about how they wish they could have done this, wish they could have done that. And that's a really fun thing to work with when coaches aren't the ones trying to make corrections. The players are taking the initiative themselves. And, and uh, when you have that going on, man, it's going to be really, really special. Our guys work really hard, study film, and they've really put in a lot of the work. And I, I'm so proud of our players. This week, Cougars will be taking on the Liberty Flames, who have made the 1,700-mile trip from Lynchburg, Virginia, to Provo, Utah. In this, their first bowl-eligible season in the FBS, the Flames have jumped out to a 6-3 and three start behind their high-powered offense. And that offense sure did put on a show last week as the Flames routed the UMass Minutemen 63-21. Liberty came out strong, and they came out fast, putting the game out of reach pretty much by the end of the first quarter. It was 28-7. QB Stephen Calvert shredded the UMass defense with a school record 474 passing yards and four touchdowns on the day. And he almost uh, didn't come away with that record, though. He was close with over 400 yards passing at halftime. And then he completed one pass in the second half before getting pulled for the backup just, you know, in a runaway game. But fortunately, that one pass did put him over the old record and and into the book. Wide receiver Antonio Gandy-Golden had a day on the other end of all those passes, too, with six catches for 127 yards and a touchdown. Something for the Cougars to look out for today. And uh, keep this result in mind, too, because after playing Liberty today, BYU also will head to Amherst, Massachusetts on November 23rd to play those Minutemen. But today, the Liberty Flames are hoping to become bowl eligible with a win against the Cougars in their first ever football game in the state of Utah. When we come back, we will learn more about the newest team to join the FBS, the Liberty Flames. Stay tuned. Did you know the Flames won at least a share of the Big South Conference title eight out of the last ten years, immediately before moving up to FBS play? There are 130 teams that play FBS football, and every one of them has a different story. We are listening to the fight song of the newest program to fight for bowl eligibility starting this year, and it's the Cougars' opponent today. It's the Liberty Flames. Here to educate us on all things Liberty football past and present, we have the play-by-play radio voice of the Flames, Alan York. Welcome into the Cougar tailgate, Alan. Cole, good to be on with you, man. Appreciate it. Fantastic. So I've had the pleasure this year to talk to folks from all sorts of schools about their program history and traditions. But today, I need you to start at the basics for me. Where is Liberty University and what's the school all about? Liberty University uh, geographically is in Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, You might wonder, where is that? (laughs) It's an equal distance between Blacksburg, Virginia to the west, where Virginia Tech is, Mm -hmm and an hour south of Charlottesville, where the University of Virginia is. If you're not familiar with those two big-time uh, ACC schools, then we are two hours west of Richmond, Virginia, and about two hours north of Greensboro, North Carolina. A little bit more background on the school. Yes. It was founded in 1971 uh, by uh, Reverend Jerry Falwell. His son, uh, Jerry Jr., is now the president of the school. Uh, Jerry's brother, Jonathan, is the head minister, preacher, if you will, of the church, uh, which is Thomas Road Baptist Church, which has a big affiliation uh, with uh, the school. Mm -hmm. And the school is the largest Christian school in the world. Uh, We have upwards towards 15 to 20,000 residential students and uh, close to 100,000 
online, uh, including wow. myself. A couple of years ago, earned my master's degree from Liberty. Congrats. Uh, so I can count uh, me part of that and being a Liberty alum. But that's kind of the background of the school. And again, we've uh, been uh, uh, just really anticipating a matchup with the likes of BYU because uh, Dr. Falwell back in the day said he wants Liberty uh, to be for the Christians what BYU is to the Mormons and uh, Notre Dame is to the Catholics. So check one off of the list with a BYU matchup here tonight. Oh, and hey, you're you're in the right conference per se then too for us because y'all have joined Notre Dame and us in independence. <laughs> That is correct. A couple of years ago, uh, February of 2017, NCAA passed a waiver uh, for Liberty to go as an independent in FBS. Typically, yes, you do have to be invited to a conference, but there are uh, more than one way to skin a cat. Mm -hmm. And uh, NCAA, uh, through some great conversations with uh, uh, our school and administration, uh, thought it was a, a great idea for Liberty to be able to go um, as an independent in FBS, and uh, a lot of that has to do with you know the success that Liberty had as an FCS program uh, in the Big South, winning uh, multiple championships and uh, financially being in a good spot. And not only that, just a rabid fan base uh, that uh, you'll you'll see some smattering of those red shirts there at the stadium there tonight. Uh, but there's been a lot of support with Liberty football uh, and uh, moving forward to this FBS, uh, which now we are fully fledged and uh, bowl eligible with one more win, hopefully uh, this year. I mean, hopefully, hopefully, maybe not today, but hopefully there you some, go. Uh, well, for it. <laughs> depends on what side of the, uh, the, the the field we're on. You bet. But as we always say, good luck, except for tonight, right? That's 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 the way yep. to do it. Hey, so let's wind back just a little bit. Then you've you've been doing this gig for about ten years there at Liberty. You mentioned some of those Big South championships, right? What Correct. what brought Liberty to the doorsteps of FBS now and and bursting through? Well, I just think, number one, success on the field. Number two, uh, rabid fan base. We have a great following for our football program, not only uh, at home at Williams Stadium, but on the road. And uh, I think there has to be a financial component set to that um, when it comes to some of the assets that the school has and the endowment. Um, and ever since I got here in 2010, the football program was operating from a financial standpoint like an FBS team, um, not only from uh, on the field process, Product, but uh, radio and TV as well. Uh, very similar to what uh, you guys do with BYU TV and the radio. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's something that I know we've looked up to uh, from building our uh, TV and radio platform as well. So what are some of the names that people might be familiar with that have come out of this program over the course of the years? Sure. I'll name a few, uh, and not only on field, but off the field as well. Shannon Bream is a Fox News uh, reporter. Um, and also beyond that, uh, she was known as Sam Steele when she was here as a reporter. But uh, Sam Ponder, who now does a lot of ESPN work uh, with the uh, NFL games, and she was originally on the college football game day with those guys. So mm -hmm. uh, she's a Liberty alum. Uh, outside of that, uh, look in right now, uh, Rashad Jennings, uh, who played a lot in the NFL with the Giants and uh, the Jaguars, and recently, a year ago, won Dancing with the Stars. Yeah. Uh, so Rashad Jennings is a Liberty alum. So there's just a few. Um, and uh, Toby Mack, uh, who's a Christian country music artist, is a Liberty alum as well. Uh, so there's a few names that uh, those might be familiar. And uh, again, our president president is Jerry Falwell Jr., and uh, he's very active on social media and uh, really is a huge proponent for what we're doing here athletically and uh, does a great job at our school leading, leading the way for us. And beyond the athletics, too. We, agree, we come from the same, same kind of cloth that that's, that's an important factor of education. Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and like, you know, our motto for our school, Cole, is training champions for Christ. And I think uh, those of your fans that tune into uh, your broadcast know the, you know, the, the religious uh, importance to what you guys do at BYU, and it's no different here at Liberty. And that definitely drives us each and every day. Now, bringing it back to today, what's been some of your favorite memories from this season, this squad that you got at Liberty Football this year? Uh, well, for us, number one, even though we didn't win the game, was uh, opening up with Syracuse at home. Um, it's very rare to get, you know, Power Five school, uh, at least in their 
season opener to play on the road at a newly minted FBS team. Right. Uh, but we're able to do that. And, of course, we'll, we'll repay the visit to the Carrier Dome uh, next year. So that was cool. A uh, really great crowd on hand. And uh, moving on from that, there's been a number of individual uh, performances that I'm sure we'll get into some of our personnel here in a minute. But uh, we have a really great – a uh, senior duo in our quarterback, uh, Stephen Calvert, who goes by Buckshot. And yes, there is a backstory to that uh, middle name for him. And Yeah, you want to do that right now? Because I, I was sure. reading up, I was reading in the game yeah. notes, it says led by senior quarterback Buckshot Calvert. Um, yeah, his real name is Stephen. Uh, he, when we got here, when he got here, you know, four years ago, his family said he's going to go by Buckshot. And we're like, okay, if that's what your wishes are. But uh, his dad is a huge NASCAR fan, and uh, way back in the day, one of his favorite racers was Buckshot Jones. Huh. And so he said, whenever I have a, a, a son, preferably, I guess, hopefully, I'm going to name him Buckshot. And the wife said, no, as he's they do, Stephen. And as a concession, the dad said, okay, you can have the wishes of the first name. But let me have the wishes of the middle name. And the mom said, sure. And so they named him Buckshot. And as you know, growing up through Little League and things, all the kids have nicknames. Yeah. And so it just stuck with him. And he very rarely gets called Steven, even though I do, just to see if he'll turn his head. <laughs> but he answers to both. I mean, the professors call him Steven, but everybody knows him as Buckshot. And um, his tandem mate is a uh, classmate. Antonio Gandy Golden, who today um, we're going to be talking about it on our broadcast, uh, just got a spot on the uh, the Senior Bowl, you know, presented by Reese's uh, down in Mobile, Alabama. So that's exciting for Antonio. And uh, so just a couple of names that uh, we'll talk about here today. Uh, really, uh, really two really, really great stewards of our university. And uh, looking down on your schedule, I have a question. Do do you really play New Mexico State twice? Was I yeah. were my eyes playing tricks on me? No, not not at all. And actually, Cole, we did it last year as well. That's so cool. uh last year we had, you know, the first full fledged season going uh SBS as an independent, as you guys know at BYU, you play anybody anywhere, anytime. Heck and yeah. that's kind of what we've done here uh the last couple of years, and you'll see a number of similar teams on your schedule uh, like you had with us last year, including a game at UMass. We just played there last uh, uh, last week. Boy, and, and we're uh, hoping for a similar result of what you guys put up against them. Uh, well, if it's anything like uh, you guys did it up in Logan, then uh, <laughs> we, we might be in for some fireworks here tonight coming yeah. off the game we had at UMass. But, uh, yeah, New Mexico State is, is one independent as well and they needed some holes to be filled in their schedule. And so it was a very rare home-and-home uh, home, uh, with them last year and this year. So um, and, we, and we fared better out there this year. We lost last year to them out there, but uh, played much better this time around. And, uh, yep, see them again uh, for our Military Appreciation Day coming up on November 30th. Now, normally I come into these interviews with a little bit of prior knowledge of what to ask about right we played usc earlier this year i know fight on i know tommy the trojan the coliseum that kind of stuff but right. today i'm i'm just learning about liberty so what are some of those kind of traditions or do you have a mascot what are what are kind of those fun goofy things that's a great question cole uh our mascot is an eagle and his name is sparky <laughs> and um there's biblical references to liberty being in the bible and the the genesis of that, I, I need to dig a little bit deeper as well as far as the mascot and why it's um, uh, why the eagle. But again, eagle is kind of synonymous with being proud and American, and our, our colors are red, white, and blue. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's probably what it is. And if you go back and look at all the stories and the annals of all these different mascots and. 99% uh, of them, it was a student vote. So I guarantee yep. if we look back on the Sparky theme, it's going to be a student vote way back in the day. Um, but, uh, you know, beyond that, we're, again, our school, again, it seems, uh, at least it does to me, um, uh, pretty young, and it is. Uh, only, you know, founded in 1971. So uh, we're still building those traditions that have been, you know, synonymous with a lot of schools for 100 years. Um, and so uh, f from that perspective, um, 
you know, Sparky is one of the first things that does come to mind as far as having traditions. We got chants and things that the students do, you know, at the home games and things like that. And um, but we're still building our brand, um, even though we're FBS and we're a, a worldwide brand with the reach of our online program. We're still building those traditions as we move on. So um, I hope that helps answer your question just yeah. a little bit. And we do have a fight song, obviously, uh, jokingly, as you played it at the outset of this interview. So uh, the band won't be with us here tonight. Um, but we were at uh, Rutgers two weeks ago up in Piscataway, and their band uh, played our fight song before the game. So that was kind of cool. Rutgers, that's the birthplace of college football. We're celebrating 150 years. So whether it's that's right. 40 years on the field or 150 or um, 100 or so that BYU's got, it, we all make up the college football landscape. Yeah, we do. And you know, we've got our guys in the NFL that uh, have made it to that level as well. So, um, again, I'm always curious, when I, and I'll talk to Greg hopefully later on tonight mm -hmm. um, at some point and kind of shake hands with him and just curious on when people see Liberty on the schedule, they'll scratch their head and they'll be like, okay, uh, okay. Okay, they D1, D2, and yeah, we're FBS. And that's part of the branding thing I'm talking about. A lot of people, even our student athletes today, uh, are like, hey, I'm always curious on your recruiting story. And they're like, well, when you guys called, I had no clue where that was or who it was. And so we still have a ways to go to get that brand up. And uh, we're making inroads uh, each day that uh, we're around and uh, just continue to educate people on who we are and what we do. I love it. I'm glad to help. Did did y'all leave any big rivals back in the Big South Conference, or has any? I mean, new, playing New Mexico State yeah. twice a year seems like it's the formulation of a bit of a rivalry. It's kind of unique, but in football, independent, uh, it's going to be a while before we build a rivalry. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, and a year ago, we did move from the Big South to the A Sun and all of our other sports. Ah. And so um, we're a lot of moving and shaking here on campus, uh, a lot of uh, cranes on campus, a lot of buildings uh, being fabricated as well. Uh, but uh, we had a huge rival in, you say, did, did, did we leave anybody behind? Well, they left us before, before us uh, leaving the Big South, and that was Coastal Carolina. Uh, they the were the Chanticleers, uh, right? The Chante Chanticleers, <laughs> yeah. yeah, from uh, – Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, if you want to go back and, and dig up that story. But it's it's a chicken, it's a rooster, uh, very similar to a in-state uh, rival of theirs, uh, South Carolina, which is a Gamecock. So the, 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 the mascot looks very similar. Uh, but uh, the, the Liberty Coastal rivalry goes back uh, even years before I got here because both teams were, were competing for the all-sport trophy, which is called the Sasser Cup in the uh, Big South. And it was mm – -hmm between Liberty and Coastal each year. And so it just uh, it funneled down to the football field. And so that was a big-time rival for us in the Big South. And we're still building those uh, in the A-Sun. Liberty basketball went to the NCAA tournament uh, last year, beat Mississippi State in the first round, and so went to the round of 32. And uh, baseball won the A-Sun championship last year as well. So a lot of cool things outside of football going on here at Liberty that a lot of the fans uh, tuning in to the uh, BYU network tonight may not know about well yeah and I, I was going to ask you you're the do you do play-by-play -play for basketball as well i do yeah so do you got uh, any start, bold predictions for the season uh for us yeah um it, I, I hesitate but we've got a you know the crew last year that won a school record 29 games uh that they, they bring back the entire roster except uh one senior from a year ago who was really good four-year starter and Lavelle Cabell, he was kind of our defensive stopper. But everybody's back. Uh, Preseason number one in the ace sun. All and right. It's going to be fun. Uh, team opened up last night at home against Radford, and uh, that was a, a, a very competitive ball game. And we play again coming up tomorrow. We, we land with a two-hour time difference about 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Oof. And I'm right back at it at 2 o'clock uh, for basketball against uh, Maryland Eastern Shore uh, tomorrow afternoon. So no no rest for the weary, but uh, you guys that do what you do at BYU and Greg included, it's no different uh, with this kind of overlap season, but uh, it's why we do what we do and we love it. This is the fun part of the calendar year as far as I'm concerned. Before I let you go, I, I got to ask you just what do you think, what are some more things you think are going to happen today? 
you don't have to make a prediction if that's not your style, but <laughs> what else do do the fans of both teams need to look out for, from your opinion? Well, I mean, you just look at uh, what BYU is doing right now from a two and four start. They now have won two in a row, and just listening to all the podcasts and uh, Coach Satake, um, he's thrilled at uh, kind of the turnaround they're having right now. And you look at the schedule; it's it's setting up uh, for a. a, a a pretty stretch run for BYU and just looking to see what you know you guys are doing defensively with the three down linemen and a week ago at Utah State and uh, it's going to be that's going to be the battle I think as far as what you know Buckshot and our passing offense can do against just the length um, of the back eight and the linebackers are just you know with the 10 interceptions of the 12 y'all have this yeah. year it's just it's going to be it's going to be fun to watch um, you know, obviously we're playing with 85 scholarships just like a BYU is, but again, it's our second year in this uh, highest level of college football. Um, but can anything happen? Absolutely. I don't think uh, BYU expected to go to Toledo on September 28th and fall 28-21 or even to use – SF in Tampa in mid October. At the same time, uh, I was watching Kalani's, you know, TV radio show this week, and he has a lot of respect for what Hugh Freeze, our head coach, uh, brings to the table, and and vice versa. So um, it's going to be a fun uh, one to watch here tonight, and uh, just tickled to be a just a spoke in the wheel and on the on the plane coming out there. You betcha. And I always root for a competitive game, no matter what. I appreciate you coming on. Alan York is the play-by-play man for football and basketball for the Liberty Flames. Thanks for coming on the show today. Cole, appreciate it, and uh, good luck to you all the rest of the season. Thank you. When we come back, we will chat Liberty and BYU and Notre Dame and what independence really means for those schools. But first, we will talk with The Rock. And this time, we've got the president and vice president of the student section to talk about what they have going on for all the sports on campus today. Don't go anywhere. Did you know the Steelers' Pro Bowl tight end Eric Green is Liberty's highest draft pick to the NFL? He went in the first round in 1990. tailgate i'm cole wessinger here on the show we try to bring the fan experience into your home or your car wherever you're listening along and we do that by getting to know the opponent as we just did with alan york uh, just a real pleasant guy i had a great time talking with him today we also chat with byu fans in a segment we call rock talk named after the byu student section the rock and today we have a very special edition of that for you This is Rock Talk on Cougar Tailgate. All right, fellas, introduce yourself to the people, please. All right. Well, my name is Jason Hewlett, and uh, I'm a student here at BYU, and I am the president of The Rock. I'm from Houston, Texas, and uh, my vice president is Bradley. Yeah, I'm I'm Bradley Pilkington. I'm the vice president of The Rock. Um, I'm from all over the place. Grew up kind of in a bunch of different places, but most recently is... Uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. We are in that beautiful part of the sports year, fellas, where a lot is going on at once. Today, all at home, there's a women's soccer regular season finale, men's hoops, and of course, football. Um, you guys going to any games today? Oh, we'll be at all. <laughs> yeah, we're 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 not going to miss out on any of the games. We're going to make sure to get to all of them. <laughs> it's it's what we love to do, and it's uh, it's something that. I mean, we really want the students to just have the best experience possible. And the fact that we have three games all today just really gives us an opportunity to to kind of dedicate ourselves today on a Saturday just to the rock. And so you know, we're just going to go hard today. <laughs> okay, so let's back up just a second. You guys are the ones to tell us, um, what does the rock actually mean? Where did it get that name? Yeah, so the the origin of the name – to be completely honest, I'm not sure, but what it stands for is the War of the Cougars, um, and so that's that's the uh, that's the name that we go by. We just shortened it with the Rock. 
That is correct. Yep. It's the official student section of BYU. So being on that rock board, being officers, being official ambassadors, I guess, take us behind the scenes. What What is it that you do to make the game day experience a great one for all the fans? Well, um, I think, I think first of all, I just uh, would say that there is a great deal of behind the scenes stuff that, that most people don't see. We, as a board, we meet weekly um, to discuss ideas for the upcoming week and for, for games in the future. Um, you know, we, we really focus on everything pregame, in game, and even just like outside of the game, like activities on mm-hmm. campus for the rock, things like that. Yeah. Well, just to tag along with what Jason was saying is a lot of our focus is on the experience of the students and, and whether that is in the game, after the game, before the game, um, but also even completely outside of sports. Um, a big emphasis that we have is on campus, making sure that if we're doing advertising for the sports, that the student body is having a good experience with us and, and it's drawing them out to the game. Um, I'd say that a lot of our, our board and our, ourselves included, we're, we're putting tons of hours in behind the scenes that not a lot of people see, but it, it's all worth it when you get a, a full rock and, and everybody's having a good time. Talking before the scenes, let's kind of go in order then. We've spoken to some of the administrators that were in charge of getting the Cougar Canyon put together. But as people that have been there and from the student side, what what is it that Cougar Canyon does and means to you guys? Yeah, I, one one thing that, that's been a common theme for, for the, the Rock this year, um, specifically with the board and an emphasis that we put on is the pregame experience for football. Um, we've been really looking to revolutionize. I mean, BYU athletics as a whole, we've been looking to revolutionize the pregame experience for the students specifically. And so Cougar Canyon has been awesome because we have what's called the rock cave. Um, it's just a little, it's actually a pretty big tent that's, that's located on Cougar Canyon there and kids can go there. There's, there's, um, tailgate games. There's NCAA game day playing on the TVs. Perfect. Got the, the official drink of the rock, it's called Randall's. Um, we, we've got that there. We're usually having food for the students as well as water. Ultimately, we just want to build this hype before the game and create a, a good atmosphere. So that way that carries on into the stadium and everybody's, everybody's ready to go and, and get, get the student section bump in. Yeah. And just to, just to add on to what Bradley's saying about how, you know, our, our goal has just been to re- revolutionize the pregame experience. And, um, uh, in the past several years, we have tried a lot of different things. You know, we in past years we've had the car drops where somewhere on campus there was a there was a car drop that happened and students had to rush to that location to get a spot in line and and we um, you know we tried tailgating on the north field or the field just north of the stadium mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and and this year we feel like it, like everything has just kind of paid off and all those experiences experiences have kind of just led us to. Um, the the rock cave at Cougar Canyon mm-hmm. um, this year. Just everything we've learned from those different things, we've been able to just shape into what is the rock cave, and and it's been a fantastic mm-hmm. success. We've had yeah. um, hundreds of students every game come through the rock cave, and and we just think that Cougar Canyon as a whole is just kind of this new tradition that's really going to pay off for years um, yeah. here at here at BYU. Now is the time to be a BYU fan. It's true. You guys talk about this new tradition. What's one of your favorite old traditions at any of the sporting events? What's one of your favorite cheers or things that the students do to interact with the team? Oh, I'll start, Brad. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think I think that just one of the uh, one of the best things that that the Rock does, and I, I think it's hard to beat turbulence and and the flag that goes up um, at mm-hmm. basketball and football games. You know, at football we do it um, before the fourth quarter, um, and we you know we play turbulence, and the flag goes up in three different parts of the student section, or the flags, sorry, go up in three different parts of the student sections. And then at basketball, it's towards the end of the second half, um, and the lights dim, and the 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 music's playing. It's just bumping. I think I think that that's a tradition that's hard to beat, and I've I've heard from a lot of the players that that just seeing the rock get excited like that just just gives them so much energy. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with Jace on that one. Turbulence is definitely one of my favorites, but I think another one that I love um, that we, we typically only tend to do at, at basketball and football just because it's it's 
a little bit easier there. We do do this one at volleyball as well sometimes. Um, is It's called BYU Around. And so oh, yeah, the, yeah. the rock is B, and then it goes Y, U, Cougars, and then it just goes around the entire stadium. And when you have, like in, in Lavelle, when you have 63,000 people packed in Lavelle and you've got BYU Around going on, it is incredible um, to hear that. And I, I think that's something that, I've enjoyed. I, I often get chills when we when we do that one. That's the one that I thought Agreed. of immediately because even listening to it on the radio from my vantage point, you can hear the surround sound of B Y U yeah. Cougars and just like that wave of noise comes through. It's mm-hmm. it's really cool. Yeah, and that one's yeah. especially fun because it's something that that we the rock start because we're you know we're the first letter and so when <laughs> yep. we start it we just we just try and get the rest of the the stadium going and and yeah it's a fun one for sure Who, who's in charge who decides to go b like to get it going <laughs> well at, at basketball we always do it after tip um and so it's kind of just like we know that that every every basketball game after tip off we're gonna start and we just you know tell everybody around us we're gonna start it and and it catches on pretty quick mm-hmm So the other thing in the stands that's a go-to is the food. And I'm going to ask what your favorite snack is, and you can say Cougar Tails if you want. But if you do, you have to give me a number two as well. Give give me something different (laughs) that's your must-eat when you go to the Marriott Center or Lavelle. Wow, that's that's tough. So for me, um, this is actually – I'm going to throw in a little plug for my celiac members here. So I have celiac disease. (laughs) And so last – I think – I believe it was last year – that they added the gluten-free section. They have like a little gluten-free vendor, um, and it's it's still all BYU food, but they've just made it all gluten-free, and so I'm able to actually enjoy my game day experience even more. Right on. Um, so one of my favorite things from there, though, is, is they have the classic BYU mint brownie. I hope that that's okay to say that that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. It's, it's gluten-free. I, ha- I hadn't had like a, a brownie in, in years, and then I show up one of these game days, and I see – a gluten-free section. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. This is the best thing that's ever happened at BYU. <laughs> and so I, I was, I'm now able to to eat um, before the games, you know? Um, and, and so the mint brownie is probably what I would say is my favorite, favorite treat before games. And Jason? Well, uh, to be honest, I'm not much of an eater during games. I don't know what it is about really? me. I, 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 I generally don't. Don't eat much. I love I love during baseball season when we do dollar hot dogs at, at Miller Park. Mm. Those are always great. Um, but but honestly, it's hard for me to pass up a, a cold Coca Cola just in one of the stadium <laughs> cups to just sip on during the game. I, I think that's hard to beat. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate you went to baseball because it's more of a laid back environment. I feel like if you're in the student section for football and basketball, you don't want to go anywhere. You are involved the whole game. Mm-hmm. No trips yeah, to the true. concessions. Yeah. <laughs> and at that baseball, I mean, you have in between innings where it gives you a great opportunity to go get some concessions. You bet. Hey, so what's a memory from being in the stands from your entire time being a Cougar fan that you will just never forget? Yeah, so my, mine was actually my freshman year. Um, it was the game. It, so we had just come off of the, the Hail Mary um, from Mangum to Mitch Matthews in Nebraska. Mm-hmm. And then that that first home game was against Boise State, and I don't know if you remember. I don't know if you were here for that game, if you, whatever. But I that remember. Game I know where you're going. Was incredible when Tanner Mangum threw that pass to Mitch Mer- Jurgens. I lost my mind. Um, and, and then later on, like right after that that drive, uh, Kai Nakua picked picked them off, and that sealed the game. And that was just. And then we rushed the field. And that the the buzz that came from that, there was such a good feeling in Lavelle. Um, like it, it literally almost brought me to tears. Like I was just so excited and just going crazy, um, pushing people over to get down <laughs> to, onto the field. It was just an experience that I will never, ever, ever forget. So that, was... that's got to be top five sporting event in general, like games that I've been to. And then for BYU, it's definitely number one. For that Boise State game, I was living just south of campus next to Brick Oven. And I remember when he threw that second Hail Mary in a row, we opened up our door, like people were running outside, and I could hear Lavelle Edwards Stadium from my house. That is the loudest (laughs) I think it has ever gotten. Seriously, though. It was insane. All right, Jason, you had time to think. What do you got? 
<laughs> so um, for I'll, I'll give a basketball one. Honestly, I think one of the the greatest sporting events I have been to at BYU um, was when we played the University of Utah at home two years ago, and it was uh, it was the safety first game. It's been it's been called because it was uh, you know the first time we had played after Coach K at Utah decided that we weren't going to that they they weren't going to be playing the rivalry anymore because he thought it was unsafe. And so for that game, the rock, the entire rock dressed out in safety vests and safety helmets. And, and we had a, a chant going anytime that Utah fouled, we, the whole rock would chant, that's not safe. And, and it like, it was just one of the most memorable basketball experiences. And it was honestly hilarious. Just the things <laughs> that the students would come up with to chant at Utah. And I mean, we spanked them. So um, that makes it all the and, better. <laughs> It makes it even better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's that fan interaction that we love to promote here on the show and that we love just hearing stories about. I just got one more question for you before we go. For a Cougar fan that's maybe in enemy territory today in California or in Virginia, anywhere across the nation for that matter, that has never been here to Provo for a BYU game, can you try to put into words what it's like watching the Cougars play live and, and interacting as a fan? It, it's really just an experience that I hope that everybody that might be in enemy, enemy tor- territory will get to experience at some point. I mean, we've got some of the best fans in the nation, and, and at away games, you know, they all show out, and that's incredible. We always have so many fans at away games, and um, – just imagine that times a thousand. It like really here in Lavelle or in the Marriott Center, or honestly any of the venues, the Smith Fieldhouse, Miller Park, whatever it is, it's just an incredible environment that like you just I don't know, you get a lot more excited than you would I feel like at at, at any other place. And and really that just comes down to how great the fans are and how dedicated and, and loyal they are. Yeah, so so uh, as I said earlier, um I moved around a lot and so I've been to a lot of different universities been to a lot of football games at other universities a lot of other basketball games in my growing up um and i have to say that byu is is definitely one of the best um if not the best uh as as jason was saying fan bases in the nation um being in lavelle being at the marriott even being at southfield or for soccer or being in the smithfield house for volleyball it's still an incredible experience um, you've got fans who are cheering at the top of their lungs. You've got people who are, you know, just being super positive towards the teams. And, and it's just contagious. Like, you just feel this energy and this buzz about you um, that's really unmatched at any other university that I've been to. Um, and obviously, yeah, there's, there's a ton of other universities that I haven't been to, but I've been to quite a few. And so I can feel confident in saying that BYU is definitely the best um, as far as their, their fans at the sporting events. And so if you are in enemy territory, um, you know, would, would love to have you guys eventually make your way out to Provo. But if you can't make your way to, to those games when BYU is traveling, but the, the experience that's at, at BYU is, is definitely unmatched. It is a cold day today here in Provo, but if you're coming out to any of the games, you're going to have company. I've been speaking to Jason and Bradley. They are the president and vice president of the Rock student section here at BYU. Thank you one more time, fellas. Thank Thank you, you. we appreciate it. When we come back, the focus is back on Liberty and our fellow independent kind of conference foes. That's coming up next on the Cougar Tailgate. Did you know the Liberty basketball team has been to the NCAA tournament four times, including this past year, when they upset Mississippi State in a 5-12 matchup? Flames started their move from the Big South Conference in FCS play to Big League FBS in 2017. Played their first year in 2018 and are now a full FBS member eligible for bowl eligibility. They're one game away from securing that this year. Conferences are everything in college football. Big Five, Group of Five, the American calling itself the Power Sixth. But Liberty chose independence, a route that BYU fans are very familiar with. Terry South comes around every week to chat about 
just, you know, whatever's going through our minds that week. And right now, what's going through mine is independence. How you doing, Terry? Doing well. Do you feel independent? I do. Like you're, my own man. You're recently graduated. <laughs> <laughs> That's what independence means to me. So the FBS schools that are independent right now, Terry. Yes. We've got us, BYU. That's right. Liberty, who we played today. Recently. Recent, very independent. Recently. Yeah. This year. Notre Dame is among that. Historically independent. Folks have heard of Notre Dame. Yes. In fact, their entire athletic department is in the Big Ten. Yes. Uh, ACC. Or is it the all oh, right? It's the ACC. Yeah, basketball. It, it's hard because they play all these people in the Midwest uh-huh. and claim them all because they've been playing them for decades. Michigan, Michigan but yeah, State. Yeah, they're in the ACC. And then. They're football independent because they feel like they can just roll with that NBC contract and be fine. Yeah, and the thing is, most of the big schools used to be independent. In the 80s, it was cool to be independent. Mm. And then slowly everyone started finding their conference alignment. The, the and BCS Dame cartel was formed. Didn't. And yeah. they, they curtailed all the TV money. Then the SEC rose to power and kind of just... This became, is a Game of Thrones kind of became, thing. Huh? Yeah, they became the overwhelming force in the uh, the BCS, and then everyone complained. And so occasionally they'll give them a little bit here. Okay, are you a you're a? They have the Power Five, and then what do they call the the rest of them? What's the group of five? Right, right that's it, the feel, others. It, it feels condescending. The other team, the group of five. They, okay, we'll give you one if you're in the top ten. Mm. And yeah, whatever. And then that's all like a a UC. Was it a UCF? Yep. So Central Florida, they, yeah. they rose to promise. Boise State's gotten there a couple times. Oh, UCF and, claims a national championship because oh, they right. weren't given the chance to. I remember that. Uh, that uh, that's what this playoff was supposed to solve, right? So like conferences, when they were still trying to figure things out back in the late 90s, just before BCS, the Rose Bowl wasn't playing nice, right? They, right. Had, they made the Big Ten and the Pac-10 play each other. And so if you were supposed to be a national champion contender, but you were in one of those two conferences, you didn't play another good team. You had to play in the Rose Bowl. Right. And then we tried to get past that, and then we tried to get past it again. But the independents are the ones that have just been kind of left out of all of this conference fun. Uh, uh, BYU, of course, goes the other way, leaves the conference, mainly because they're they're in kind of a, a no-man's land out here in between conferences. Because the Pac-12, I mean, the way TV conferences work now, look, they con- they want a footprint for their TV networks. Yes, geographic Ge- footprint. A geographic footprint, and because the Pac-12 already took the University of Utah, the footprint that BYU sits in is the same as the University of Utah. Now I know BYU claims a national footprint and all this, but you can't gauge a national footprint. You can gauge- ESPN can try. Eh, they don't really help much. They gauge a local footprint by ratings and those types of things, right. and they can say, here's your population. And so when the University of Utah already brings that population, BYU joining the Pac-12 doesn't help the Pac-12 put more eyeballs in their total number of people in their television footprint, yeah, right? Yeah, like TV-wise, I'm pretty sure Provo, Utah is still just the Salt Lake City metro area. It is. Right? So, so it, they're just we redundant. We don't contribute. Which is why they went and took Colorado. To come with Utah, to you know what I mean, which is an extra metro. It's a whole, get, yeah, mm-hmm. you, that's a whole different thing. So BYU, like, so then the Big Twelve, they there's all these rumors every all, every time somebody breathes that there's going to be expansion, right? Ooh. But the Big Twelve looks at it and they're like, how big is that market? Is that something we need to add? Because if you add a team, then you have to like split your money another share, right? So everyone loses money by adding a school. So what can you take the money that you're going to get from adding that school? Is that going to raise the total amount you can get for the overall television product that you're going to put on your TV network? When and I was talking I don't before they... and after my interview with Alan York, yeah. he he talked a lot about the money that Liberty was bringing to the table. And I didn't really care, and I didn't really yeah. bring it up in the interview either, but that is really what all of this comes down to. The it's big, money. The Big Ten expanded and took Rutgers. Which is a terrible football Rut- team. Yeah, they don't have any, they don't have like a, a vast history of football. They got them because then they could well, claim New York they, City. They have a vast, Rutgers literally played the very first game well, 150 years. I know, I know, years. but it's not like a winning history, <laughs> right. right? You don't have like 50 national championships right, right, right. and all these people in the Hall of Fame, all these guys in the NFL. That That's not the kind of history they bring. Right. They bring New York City. Oh, yeah. Even though you could probably look at it and say no one in New York watches Rutgers football. 
no. but you can claim it when you're talking TV markets. And that's why they took Rutgers. Interesting. So a lot of these independents, if you look at them, New Mexico State, they're an independent school. Yeah. Are they're they, a uh, winless independent school also. Right. And so it's kind of, they're in Las Cruces, right? It's Which is not, not even a, El Paso, the one city I know in New Mexico. And so like TV market wise, I guess if you're trying to fill out because the TV network you're negotiating with wants you to have like a 12 or a 16 then, yeah. then that would work just to fill out the number, but they don't, they're not bringing you a lot of eyeballs when it comes to TV, right? And Notre Dame, of course, they have their own TV contract, which is kind of what BYU was hoping for when they went independent, is kind of model it on what Notre Dame did. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that BYU hasn't achieved is being able to be looked at as an equal to Notre Dame when it comes to the BCS. Yeah, BCS considers, even when they write their rules of who gets into the playoff, it's Power 5 and Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And then when they talk about the group of five, it's group of five and all the other independents, which is us. And BYU at one point asked, can we be considered on the same level as Notre Dame? And the BCS went, no. (laughs) It wasn't even, they took, I think they took a week out of just to be nice, but oh, yeah. it was probably just a reflex action. Or No, absolutely not. Because they have a lot of history and they can pull a national audience mm-hmm. because they have a NBC contract and they can look at the ratings and see that people watch their game. Even when they're playing Toledo, they'll just, people watch that game. It's on TV. And so. Notre Dame is top 10 at least once every year until they n- naturally disappoint and everything. But, right. but to be fair, BYU, even if we got that like Notre Dame, you know, benefit of the mm-hmm. doubt, I guess we still end up losing enough that you can't justify the right. rankings. And, and, th- and like that's that. something that's you, you, they have to fix through recruiting yeah. and try to do things. And then uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst, that's BYU's not there in two weeks, right? Yep. Idaho, then UMass. Yep. And, uh, yeah, UMass, eh, they're okay. They came here and beat BYU, didn't they? Yeah, that was during BYU the rough year. Went, BYU went back there and won. And now they uh, they got beat up pretty bad by Liberty. Oof, last... 63 points they allowed. Yeah. So they're the... allowing the most points in our little independent, not a conference, conference so would standings. would BYU get over 30 points when they play UMass? We kind of hope so. Hope so? Just yeah. see some scoring? Notre Dame separates itself from the rest of the independent conference that they're not really in. Also, based on their schedule that we've mm-hmm. kind of talked about, when you're independent, you get to pick your own schedule. You don't have that locked-in conference time. But Notre Dame doesn't schedule us other independents. When you no. look at New Mexico State's schedule, and we talked about this as well, they play Liberty twice this year. Yeah. They've got a home-and-home home during the course of the year. Which doesn't happen, right? BYU's got Liberty and UMass on our schedule. Right. UMass has a couple of, you know, Navy and UMass are playing today, as a matter of but fact. Notre Dame has kind of made their own conference schedule, if you will, because every year they play the, the uh, military academies. Right, they play Army. I think they play Navy. I don't know if they play Air Force every year. They play Army and Navy, I believe. USC is every year. Oh yeah. They try to squeeze Michigan in. Oh yeah. There's all these all these teams in the Midwest that just they want to play Notre Dame because there's this historic rivalry there, and they can set these these schedules up and get these people to play home and home or just come to Notre Dame, you know. And so they, they're they're in such a position because of their their mystique and their history that they can have this pull. To, to set up a schedule that it seems easier for them to schedule games than it does, say, for a BYU two. So Notre Dame is the upper crust of our little conference. Do you see them leaving for a conference at any time? Are they having any of no. the struggles that it seems like the rest of the independents are as Ab- independents? Absolutely not. Yeah, They, they, they make uh, a bunch more money from their NBC contract. They make more money, I think, than most schools do. Um like BYU, I, their their ESPN deal is good, but Notre Dame's is better. Yeah, you know, it's the Notre Dame network. That's all NBC does when it comes to college football until they get to a bowl game, and they usually have that one that's at Yankee Stadium that's kind of odd to watch. But what if they're the only one left? Right. So bowl game tie-ins that yeah. has to do with it. What mm-hmm. if BYU ends up in the American and New Mexico State goes to the Sun Belt and UMass ends up in the ACC? If, if it still like, works for them, they'll you know, just stick if it they're, out. If they're eligible, they'll go somewhere. Right, they've shown that they win. They get that sixth win. They're in a bowl game. Yep. It doesn't matter wh- whoever's available. They'll offer them. They went to Hawaii one year, 
which uh, at the time it was the uh, the Alo- I guess it's still the Aloha Bowl, right? And it was seen as like, oh wow, Notre Dame's going to that bowl game. Do you know what they used it for? Recruiting. Mm. <laughs> the next couple years, they had a large influx of Hawaiian. Uh, uh, you know, recruits coming into the program because their head coach is out there just rolling around talking to players as he's there, and they're like, "Wow, you came all the way here." Well, you know, they had the bowl game, and but still, Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, and so it, it, they use that opportunity to do that. Plus, enjoy Hawaii, and everything was great there. But yeah, they end up. Uh, remember Manti Teo? Yes. Yeah, he was part of that recruiting. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> Him and his. Sort of girlfriend. I'm not sure how that worked. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Terry. That is uh, a little bit of our thoughts on independence, the way the conference that isn't really a conference is going this year. And hopefully BYU can pick up another of our little conference wins today against Liberty. Our time's almost up this week, but we'll put a little bow on the show when we come back. Did you know if Liberty qualifies for a bowl this year and they're only one win away, The Flames will become the fifth program in FBS history to make a bowl during their first year of eligibility after moving up to the FBS level. BYU fans, thank you for spending this hour with me. It was a busy show to match a busy day for Cougar Sports. We had Alan York of the Liberty Broadcast team, Bradley and Jason here of our own rock student section, and also, as we have on every week, Terry South, love you, great producer. And a good luck goes out to all the student athletes that are staying busy today. As football season winds down, we are going to stay plugged in to how women's soccer fares in the tournament, and also basketball season. I'll try to spend a little time every week to look at the national landscape, and boy did it start off right with the top four ranked teams all playing under the same roof. So look forward to our take on college sports, especially the Cougs, every week on Cougar Tailgate. Get in touch with the show at our email address, cougartailgate at gmail.com. That's cougar, T-A-I-L, gate, gmail.com and let us know about your fan experiences whether you're a student alumni or just diehard fan we want to hear from you this has been a production of byu radio i'm cole wissinger go kooks